What will it mean to be human when we can plug into our computers? Welcome to Future 39 with John Kutzier. Today, we plug our computers into power. Tomorrow, maybe, we plug ourselves into them. AR and VR are changing how we see the world. AI and augmentation, even brain-machine interface, will change how we live, how we work, and how we play. To talk with us today, I want to bring in Kathy Hackle. She's a LinkedIn top tech voice, former Magic Leap evangelist. She's HTC Vive evangelist as well. Actually, it's Vive, has consulted with Porsche. She's a serial author and much, much more. Welcome, Kathy. Thanks for having me, John. Such a pleasure to have you. We've known each other for a long time. I'm not sure we've ever done something like this before. So I'm super glad to have you. And I know that you were thinking this was an audio podcast until about three minutes ago. And so you had to rush. I really appreciate it. Yeah, but I got it done. I put the makeup on. We're good with video. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I I always have that thing with Vive. I want to say Vive. I know it's Vive, but I want to. I That must have been one of your challenges there. Yeah, I mean, when I first came across the brand, I was like, HTC, what? I knew HTC from like the phones back in the day, right? Yeah. Um, then, yeah, once you're in there, you're like, it's Vive, Vive, and it's Vive capital letters. Yes. Sorry. When you write yeah. it out, it's going to be capital letters. So, Vive like live. Okay, Vive. now I'll remember it. Awesome. <laughs> Let's, um, I gave a bit of an intro to you. You've been in and around AR, VR, uh, and AI, frankly, for a long time. Maybe talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit as well about the current state of where VR and AR are right now. Yeah, so I've been part of the industry, it's been about five years now. Um, it feels like dog years, to be honest. Um, but I, I always tell people, and for folks that have never heard my story before, I always say that um, I got to VR from storytelling. So I was a journalist. Um, I know you do a lot of, uh, you know, you're a journalist yourself. Um, so I, um, I was working back in 2004 for CNN, and part of my job was to look at all the raw footage that was coming in from the war in Iraq. And when you have that type of job and you're seeing things that are just not very nice, you kind of turn your humanity switch off just a little bit, right, to get by. I, I say I'm, I was a Facebook moderator before there were Facebook moderators. Um, and it wasn't until I had my first VR experience, which was in an HTC Vive, um, that I didn't feel like I was fully able to turn it back on. Um, I went to a conference back when we used to go to conferences in person. <laughs> it's funny to say that now. Um, and I put on a headset, went into an experience called Confinement by The Guardian. It's a six by nine solitary confinement um, uh, cell. And you know that was claustrophobic. Took the headset off and I said, this is a super powerful storytelling tool and this is what I want to do for the rest of, of my life. So super that's how I got started five years ago. <laughs> exactly. And so you were with Vive for a while um, and then Magic Leap. Magic Leap, of course, has had a bit of a rocky road um, and they just got another round of funding, I think $350 million or so. So hopefully they can pull something, some rabbit out of a hat here and do something interesting. But talk to us a little bit about where augmented reality and virtual reality are right now. Where's the industry? I mean, the industry is really, I think, you know, benefiting from the enterprise, from enterprise applications. I mean, if you are working in VR and AR and you're working in consumer, you know, it's not necessarily the best market. Enterprise really is where it's at. It's been there for several years. Um, when I worked with Vive, um, I was actually, you know, there when they launched the HTC Vive Pro, which was their enterprise headset. Um, and, you know, that was an enterprise product. Uh, then with Magic Leap, also, also doing enterprise. So definitely that's where the market is um, when it comes to creating solutions. I do think that, you know, that as we move forward, we're probably going to have an inflection point somewhere in 2022, 2023. I'm not going to say that it's the year of VR or the year of AR. <laughs> that has been it. said quite a bit. Yeah. Everyone says that every year, right? What I'm saying is going to be a bigger inflection point, um, you know, depending, you know, a lot of things have to align, but I, I do think that by then we're probably going to see more, um, you know, more adoption from a mass, uh, from a mass market kind of standpoint. And yet um, what we've seen right now with, from Facebook with the quest yeah. And with COVID-19 has been pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had the original, um, sheesh, what was the PlayStation PSVR? 
PSVR, yeah. I still have that. That's in a box somewhere. I spent a thousand dollars on that. Yeah. Um, and used it about ten times. Um, but when when the Quest came out, yeah, that to me was a game changer because it was inexpensive, fairly yeah. four hundred, five hundred dollars, somewhere around there. It was wire free. Yeah. It wasn't the top quality of anything in the world. Absolutely. I totally get that. But it gave you the feeling of being different world. And it, it's interesting. Um, I had my son who's a third year engineering student, you know, and he just uh, like in the tutorial for forever, just, oh, I can do that. Oh, I can do, you know, it was different for me. I, I do, you know, I got to try the Quest before it came out at one of the Ocul Oculus Connect developers conferences. And I was very impressed that this is the first real consumer product that I could see someone that is not in VR saying, I want to purchase one or want to purchase one for my kids. Yes. Right? Um, uh, so definitely, you know, I, I, you've seen it. I mean, the, they're making money. I mean, Facebook and Oculus are making money off of the games that they're selling. Uh, they're bringing a lot of things, hand tracking, a lot of things that are coming. Um, so uh, I think what they're doing is really interesting. I think it's very powerful. I mean, I had so many since the big butt coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, no. I'm I'm a big fan. Like I, the only virtual reality headset that I own is a Quest. I sold wow. all my other headsets. I wow. sold my Rift, my Vive. Like, you heard it here first, Kathy Hackle, AR VR evangelist. The only headset she owns oh, is an Oculus Quest VR. I mean, I have my Magic Leap. Oh, okay. Um, okay. That, yeah, sorry. I have VR. <laughs> <laughs> um. But you know, I had, and you probably saw this in December when it was sold out. Uh, Oculus Quest was sold out last Christmas, and I had friends reaching out, like people that are not VR industry people, reaching out saying, um, Hey, can you call someone at Oculus and help me get my Quest so that my kid can have it under the tree? You know, of course, I'm like, No, guys, you got to wait till, <laughs> until it's available. But you know, I, I definitely see that inflection point as well right now. But I do think 2023, possibly, we're going to see a bigger a bitter, bigger engagement. Um, it, you know, it, I think it, it's a great question, John, because I think people right now are like, is this is the pandemic the moment? Is this the, the breaking point? And I'm like, it's an accelerant, but it's not the end all be all. Um, I mean, if you look at location based entertainment, you know, it, like somewhere like The Void or, or somewhere there's a VR arcade right now, when I get out of pandemic is the first thing I'm, I'm going to want to do is go there and put a headset on. Probably not. Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to consider this. And as we think about what's next and AR coming up and other things like that to consider where Apple is. Right. And, and there's been a lot of speculation about that. And it seems pretty clear right now that Apple is not too interested in VR is not too interested in this socially isolating form of, I won't say entertainment because it'd be a lot of different things, including work and other things like that. And we'll get into those things, but Apple's interested in augmented reality and mixed reality in, in, in something that doesn't put a wall between me and you when we're in the same room together. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, there's so many rumors out there and I feel like every week a new analyst does a new rumor yes. on the price and when it's going to launch. So, you know, I take things with a grain of salt. Um, so, I, you know, I, obviously they're focusing on AR. They will have an AR product. I think that's no secret, obviously. When is it going to come out? I'm not sure. That's why my inflection point is either 22, 23, who knows? Um, but I do, you know, it, it's interesting to watch the purchase I did of Next VR, which is in essence a VR company. But if you look at the like, if you look at the long, um, the long game, it's it's because there's a lot of things that VR does that can you know that can inform what AR does, and eventually, because I do think that further down the line, let's say ten years, I don't know, maybe ten years, uh, the the headsets or the glasses that we wear are going to do both. Yes. Right? right now they're separate; they're two different things, but eventually they're going to do both. So. Um, so yeah, it makes sense for a company like Apple to invest in a company like NextVR. I 100% agree. I think there's a total convergence of AR and VR, and it's just about the number of pixels, right? Is it is it 10% of the pixels in my visual field that I'm affecting? Okay, it's AR, maybe M, maybe maybe mixed reality if it interacts and engages, right? But at, at some point, it'll be the same hardware, and it'll be 100% or 10%, whatever the case might be. And then you've got the best of both worlds. You can watch the movie you know, on the airplane if you ever get back on an airplane, <laughs> right, in your own space. Um, or you can... Um, 
uh, just, uh, oh, yeah, that person is so and so when you see them at a conference that maybe you're at in three years from now, or whenever we start attending conferences again. Yeah, and you know, the because I'm a big sci fi fan. Um, there's a series from Hulu called The First. Um, and that's one of the places where I've seen the best depiction of what the product could look like. And they they were wearing basically glasses that could do, you know, did a lot of AR. Um, they did volumetric calling or holographic calling, but they also at some points could do VR. Nice. Um, so that's like the one series where I've seen something like, huh, that's a good prototype, let's say, for the future. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I'm a huge, uh, huge sci-fi fan myself. I've written a science fiction book. Um, oh, I just no, I didn't know that about you. <laughs> I just finished uh, the Dune series again, the original Dune series by Frank Herbert, which I love uh, rereading every couple years or so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I I'm also watching Upload um, on Amazon Prime. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. But it's, you know, people get uploaded into the cloud, basically. And uh, anyways, uh, nearly here nor there. Let's get back on track oh, here. I do want to say something about uploads. Sorry, John. Um, <laughs> I actually got to preview it before because I did a partnership with Amazon and with Seeker. And um, I, they did, they interviewed me as a futurist. Um, nice. can, this, can this happen? Like, would this eventually happen? And we had a great conversation. So. so you were kind of consulting on the outset for this particular series? When they were launching, not so much prior. I mean, I would have loved they would have hired me as a consultant beforehand. I don't think they knew about me till when they're about to la launch. So they, they interviewed me as uh, they had an episode called Ask a Futurist. Yes. All about uploads. So we talked about, you know, can this happen? Um, et cetera, like brain, brain machine interface, um, pixels, like all kinds of stuff. So interesting, interesting. Well, cool. Hey, serendipity. I didn't know that I brought it up cause I'm doing it right now. So awesome. Well, we're going to talk about what's coming next, right? And we're talking a little bit about the future of AR and VR, but also brain machine interface. And we know that Elon Musk has a company Neuralace that's working on something here. There are other companies as well. What do you see happening here? So I've tried these technologies, not Neuralink, because that's an implant that's a lot more invasive, right? Um, I've tried more of the external kind of devices. Um, so, and actually I have one right behind me. Um, maybe I can- Yep, go you. ahead, go ahead. Let me turn around one second. It's all good. Yeah, I've got one right here. Um, I've tried these, uh, you know, different companies, Neurable, Neurosity, um, NextMind, uh, and I've been able to change channels using just my mind, dim lights using my mind. Um, do an escape room, kind of inputting numbers and codes using just my thoughts. And it's it was really impactful and really interesting to me for several reasons. Um, what I will tell you, the biggest thing I walk away from with this um, is that my brain really, really loves the workout, really enjoys it. When I think about using these technologies, it's like this endorphin, like I get this like thing where I'm like, man, I really wanna do this. So, you know, I'm like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure. I'm still sitting with that one. But my brain really enjoys this type of interaction. And then when you start to think about how we are, you know, the operating systems of the future, how are we going to engage with technology? Um, you know, and if you take it a step further and start to think about what's happening with the pandemic and kind of the touchless society that we're kind of starting to become or that we could potentially become, then you add another layer when you start to think about brain machine interface and controlling your devices, controlling what you're connected to with just your mind. Um, Can I ask a question? I know you're going to show that and I'd love to see it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But you are literally one in maybe a hundred million. I don't know. I'm guessing right here who has actually tested and tried these things. I've done one myself as well, you know, where you're trying to, in the science museum, you're trying to push the ball farther. And the, 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 the there's a person on the other side, they're trying to push the ball farther and trying to concentrate your mental efforts. I have a muse. So I know a little bit about some things that are going on there, but I have never turned on a light yeah. with my mind. I have never switched off or switched on a machine. What's that feel like? What what do you do in order to make, make that happen? You concentrate. You have to concentrate. You have to focus on, depending on what the exercise is, sometimes you would be focusing on a certain part of the screen and you have to really focus. And then it would read your, I guess it reads your brainwaves and reads your intention, right? And it makes what you're thinking happen. Um, so it's a lot of focus. It's training. Like you have to train Depending on the headset you like, I've used some of them need a little longer to calibrate. Some of them calibrate faster. 
Um, some do require training, um, like this one, like the Neurosity. This is, I mean, if you look at it, it's it's kind of stylish. Let me see if I can get it closer, but you know, and you you can see the little sensors there, and yeah. this goes kind of on your on someone's head like this. Wow, you should be in Star Trek. I know, <laughs> <laughs> so fashionable. Now it's gonna mess up my hair. Um, but you know, with this one, you have to practice. Like you can scroll your iPad with the Neurosity but you have to practice. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask about that. Yeah. Like how hard do you have to focus on concert here? Is it like, you know, you're five years old and I'm going to lift that thing with the power of my mind and you're training and you're going like, is it that hard? Is it just like, mm, turn the light switch on? It's, you know, some of the ones I've tried, have just been like, I'm just changing the channel and it happens. Um, I mean, it does require some some effort from your mind, but I wouldn't say it's like, you know, like really concentrating and um, I'm sweating or something like that, right? I'm trying to bend, I'm trying to bend a, a spoon and I'm sweating or something like that. <laughs> Yuri Geller the second. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, it does require concentration and a state of mind, I would say, to accomplish some of these things. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I consider myself a guinea pig of sorts because I enjoy trying these things. We thank I, you for I your service. It. Thank you, right? I wonder sometimes, I'm like, how much am I really, you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, but but yeah, it's interesting. I, I, the biggest thing, like I said to me, I walk away realizing that my brain really enjoys it. Like there's receptors that light up when I think about it. So Well, it's just interesting to hear what you're saying in terms of what it's like, because you have to focus, mm -hmm. concentrate some systems that works better than others. I know that um, all of us have some degrees of a smart home, right? And so I can turn on some lights with my voice or I can turn on some, some lights with an app. But typically I think, you know, am I going to pull on my phone? Am I going to open it, unlock it? Am I going to find an app, <laughs> right? Yeah. Open an app, um, wait for it to open, connect, <laughs> all that stuff, and then click light on. Well, probably not unless I'm like closing the garage when we're in bed and making sure that it's closed, right? Yeah. So that's a lot of effort using your voice and echo or siri or hey google is 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 less effort and i'm wondering where using your brain is on that scale now and it sounds like it's not too bad in some cases although a little iffy but where it'll be maybe in five years maybe it'd be as simple as thinking light on or something like that and there it goes possibly because even if you look at the current companies and what they're they've been developing over the last i would say two years they've evolved the first time I did this, I had to wear a cap and they had to put all this like goo on my head for it to be able to read my brainwaves. Um, now I can just put kind of a little device. Um, I suspect so, that would work a little bit better on me than you. Yeah, that's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> definitely true. <laughs> so, the goo. Um, yeah, the goo would work a lot, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it was hard actually. It was really hard because I have really long hair. And yes. yeah, they were like, we can't get it. <laughs> Well, and there definitely are biohackers who, um, Nick uh, Badminton, who who was uh, who commented earlier, uh, and he's a futurist, um, he has biohacked and inserted a few things and other stuff like that. Others are, you know, in Sweden, I think it's fairly uh, common for people to insert an RFID chip in their hand so they can get into their uh, apartment or something like that or their workplace. It seems like a little extreme for me right now. But I assume that's going to get more and more popular over time. And especially if I can think things into being or connect with the with the machine, uh, that's where it gets pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and com commenting on Nick, Nick actually has a chip as well. So he's biohacked and he has a chip um, and he had the whole documentary series. about Is biohacking. Bill Gates involved in this? Come on. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Was he vaccinated? <laughs> Oh goodness. Um, so, so, you know, I think we're going to see it evolve. Um, when I was watching upload, you know, they, they, um, they repeated a famous phrase is I think therefore I am right. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think, you know, our thoughts are very powerful. Um, and I brought this up with Nick the other day in a conversation we're having of potential dangers, right? Right now I'm very happy and excited about it. But what if in a dystopian, let's say, in a, in a negative future, the potential alternative futures, if people get farmed for their thoughts and their intent? Um, you know, so I think that it's conversations like these that we need to start having about what are these technologies? What are the positives? What are the negatives? Right? Yes, yes.
Yes. Yeah. Right now we have adware or malware or something like that that uses some of the cycles of our CPU to mine cryptocurrency or whoever, what else. We yeah. attach our brains all of a sudden we could be a node in a network. <laughs> with You know, it, it'd be very interesting. The other thing that's interesting, you mentioned upload again, mm -hmm. is that in upload, the the avatars there or the, the artificial humans, the uploaded ones seem to have zero privacy. Yeah. Um, people can view anything that they're doing at any given time from the company that provides it. That's an interesting caution and odd thing that they decided to do. Actually, you would assume they would have thought of it differently. Well, I, and I get that question asked, you know, when, when our world becomes the billboard, right? How do you manage that? And, I, and you've written about this. Um, you know, it, I think it was like augmented reality is the operating system of the future or something yes. along those lines. I remember the headline, but you know, when, when our reality becomes the billboard, when our reality becomes a space where things get advertised to us, um, you know, how we, do we protect people from this type of invasion, yes. right? And from the haves and have nots, if I can afford to not have ads and to only, you know, if I can afford to not have ads and turn it off when I want to, and certain people just can't, then that's a bigger divide. Yes, it is. And how much smarter would you be? How much more productive would you be without those distractions and other things like that? Yeah. Very, very smarter. interesting. Sorry, how go ahead. How much smarter? If I can access certain technologies that augment me as a human and as a worker, and other people don't have access to them, and I'm beyond, you know, like Neuralink or something like that, more invasive, right? Like that just becomes two different races of humans. You know, I asked Ray Kurzweil about this once uh, in person, and and he was talking about us being able to augment our intelligence, just like we add servers uh, on the cloud right now, because guess what? Our capacity needs to go up uh, for a website or an app, and so we're adding servers just automatically, and you can just add cores, add, add capacity for your brain. I said, well, what does it do for equality or equity when somebody who is a billionaire can add literally hundreds of thousands of extra CPUs to his or her brain. Yeah. And he said, no, that'll never happen. He, he kind of dismissed that. But it seems to me that if we get to that level of technology, uh, we will definitely bifurcate as a species because somebody will just be smarter. I mean, it's something I do worry about. And I think that's why, especially when we talk about artificial intelligence and, you know, and, and talking about brain machine interface and everything like, there's best practices and there's ethics that we need to talk about. Um, I remember what was it like two years ago, I posted in one of my Facebook groups uh, because there was a human augmentation conference about ethics. And I posted about it and then everyone came after me, like, how dare you talk about this? You know, and I'm like, no, we have to talk about this. Like, this is not science fiction. It's, it, you know, this is, we've been augmenting ourselves as humans for a long time. It's just going to accelerate and it's going to be a lot more linked to technology and, and you know in, in the yes. other sense of the word right yeah um so and as you, as we get deeper and deeper into the ai era as well uh the companies that can compete the best have the best ai the countries that can compete the best have the best ai you're better at war as a nation because you have a smarter mm -hmm. military ai you're a smarter human being because you can own or access a higher level of ai system to just help you make decisions invest better all those other things big, big questions that we are not even close to solving at our current level of capabilities. Mm -hmm. But that we need to start discussing, not yeah. Always, right? Um, yeah. Let's talk about some of your new initiatives that you're coming up with. Uh, Emerging Foresight, you're working on another book as well. Tell us a little bit about those things. Yeah. So I'm um, working on my second book. It's called The Augmented Workforce, how AR, AI, and 5G are going to impact every dollar you make. Um, and, you know, hopefully, if everything goes well, uh, it'll be coming out fall of 2020. And our main goal with it is, you know, it's a business book. Uh, it's for anyone in business, communications, technology, whichever industry they're in, that's interested in better understanding how these technologies are gonna impact the worker, the idea of work, um, automation, of course, we talk about automation, but also, you know, the concept of work as we understand it. So very excited, I'm, I'm co-writing it with um, John Bazell from Unreal. He works at Unreal Engine, so very pumped about that. Interviewing a lot of experts right now to include them in the book, and um, yeah, I'm hoping it'll be it'll be a good book. Um, it's funny because when we decided on the title for the book, 
we were thinking, um, our initial idea was like, if I'm at the airport bookstore, <laughs> right, right now we're not at the airport bookstore, but um, <laughs> if I'm at the airport bookstore and I see a title, what book would I, would I purchase and grab off the, the rack? Yeah. So, you know, I thought that was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine creating the title of something before I'm finished. I, I know I do it all the time with, with, with uh, writing on Forbes and other things like that, but often I'll change it as well. So I, I assume that you'll have, you, you might change it yet. Yeah, it potentially could change, you yeah. know, everything. So, I mean, nowadays I never say never, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think I've learned a lesson through the pandemic. So, um, so, you know, we'll see. Um, I've actually, now that you mentioned Forbes, I got um, invited to write um, as a contributor for the CMO networks, for nice. the marketing officer network. So focusing, focusing on marketing and, and some of the things there. So excited. Wonderful. About that. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. I haven't written my first piece. I'm working on it, but. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Let me know when it comes out. Yeah. Kathy, I want to thank you so much for taking this time with us. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a ton of fun. Um, and uh, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. For everybody else, thank you for joining us so much. This has been Future 39. Whatever platform you're watching on, please like, subscribe, share, comment. If you're listening to the podcast later on, rate it, review it. That'd be great. Until next time, this is John Kutz here with Future 39.